Dear students, today the discussion will be on the practicals of environmental engineering. We have done across a lot of theory, but the more but the most important in a practical is the estimation technique or how to evaluate the different parameters in water and wastewater. Okay, so first of all, we know that we are going to estimate the physical parameters, the chemical parameters, and biological parameters, and some experiments. Now, many of the physical parameters like solids, then say temperature, say in solids we have different type of solids turbidity will be explained chemical parameters like ph alkalinity say then hardness many are there here bod cod a little bit of concept of how to estimate all these techniques will be explained in this class and biological like most probable number okay here i'm not going to demonstrate you the equipment but rather what is the methodology what is the procedure just like a faculty teaching a practical class that way i'll be explaining to you okay so to begin with let me start with physical parameters solids temperature turbidity and fuel okay number one solids i'm going to make it a very shortcut just by doing a chart first let's imagine you brought a sample of water okay this is a sample of water the sample of water what you'll do is you try to make it in a funnel and then filter it out and you have another filter so what is sounding so this have a filter paper this is filter paper and this one is the funnel and you get all the waters dip by dip over here okay fine so look over here first thing is I'll say the draw the chart over here solids this is solids total now after filtering it you'll find that there will be some solids written over here right whatever it's going to here it's going to term as suspended it's going to be termed as suspended solids and whatever it's going to be here is termed as dissolved solids how to estimate these things let me explain you because this is completely wet it has to be dry so whatever solid that is present over here this is total solids okay number one this total solids can be classified in two one is suspended another one is as i explained the dissolve dissolve solids so suspended solid in this one but you cannot measure this one immediately this has to be dry so in the process what you have to do is 
suspended solids has to be dry number one at 105 degrees centigrade when and which device by using oven okay so dissolved solid also you have to find out by using 105 degrees centigrade using oven at around one hour so this has to be at one hour means this we are going to get dry how to measure i'll explain it this suspended solids this one so i'll say like this let's say this is a dry one this suspended solids this one further it is classified as number one is how this process is going to be done this will be done and at 550 degrees centigrade and around two hours and it will be in the device is called muffle furnace okay muffle furnace so after the muffle furnace this would become completely this will be there but some of them they'll get evaporated they'll convert it into gas and only some few will be left okay only few will be left i'll come and explain so one part is called the evaporated part is called volatile suspended solids because it is volatile it's gone up after burning it this one we are igniting okay so or we call it vss <clears throat> whatever the left behind we call it the left behind we call it volatile fixed solids or sometimes we call it fixed solids or s or sorry 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 not volatile fixed s residue suspended solids this can be termed as fixed suspended solids okay is it clear the same thing fixed means and sometimes this is also called inner it cannot be broken down same thing this side you have the glass over here this glass after all evaporated some some part may be left around say for example if you try to hit the water that contains sugar or salt finally at the bottom the salt initially which was dissolved will be remain at the bottom right so using the same technique using the same technique this also can be and this is called total dissolved solids or we call it tds okay by using the same technique the same technique this can be broken up as again volatile dissolved solids or vds and this will be fixed dissolved solids 
we call it FBS. Is it clear? See, initially you brought some sample. The sample is filtered out using a filter paper. Whatever stop over here is going to be suspended solids. Whatever pass through is going to be dissolved solids. So total solid is classified in suspended solids and dissolved solids. This suspended solid further, if you ignite by using muffle furnace at 550 degrees centigrade for two hours by igniting, some will get evaporated, burnt away. Those are called volatile suspended solids or VSS. Whatever left behind, it is called fixed solids or fixed suspended solids. The same thing on the other side, whatever you have this dissolved part, if you dry by using oven, you'll get total dissolved solids. At the bottom, all the water will get evaporated. By using the same technique of muffled furnace at 550 degrees centigrade for two hours by igniting, you will get two different sections, same as these two. So one is volatile dissolved solids and the one is fixed dissolved solids. Okay. Now, this volatile solids and this one, this is called total volatile solids. The combination of volatile solids in a suspended as well as dissolved, both of them is going to give the volatile total volatile solids. It's just a calculation. So this is total volatile solids. And this one and this one, this fixed suspended solids and fixed dissolved solids, whatever the fixed solids in the dissolved as well as the suspended, this two combined is going to give total fixed solids or we call it TFS. It's also another calculation, okay? Now, finally, this two, one, and this two, if you combine it, this is going to be total solids again. This is the way of the flow chart of the total solids. Is that okay? I think it's very clear. Now, to have some precaution, let me tell you, when you pour this sample out over here, when you pour it over here, you have to keep it. Okay, right. Number one, for the precautionary measures, don't filter more than five minutes. The reason is, if you keep on coming out, if it keeps on coming out, if you make it more than five minutes, the quality of the filter paper may deteriorate and it may penetrate out the solids. So don't make it more than five minutes. If it is more than five minutes, stop it. And what you can do is, if it's very, very concentrated, you can dilute it and you can do the experiments, but don't make more than five minutes. Is it clear? And the sample can be around 50 ml to 100 ml. If you take 1000 ml itself, it's very easy. But the thing is, to filter 1000 ml, it may take a very, very, very long time and it may rupture the filter paper. So you should not consider very, very high volume. But to control the rupture of the filter paper, you can take very, very loss, less volume, say 20 ml. But if you take 20 ml, whatever, if the volume is 20 ml, but everything is going to convert it into one liter. Because milligram per liter. So multiplication factor, it's going to be very, very high. Multiplication factor or dilution factor is going to be 20 into 50. It's called to 1000 ml. 
right so if you multiply by 50 times let's imagine you have one error so one error is going to multiply by 50 times it's going to magnify so even if you have a small error if your multiplying factor is very high then it's a problem therefore don't dilute much so standard wise we use 50 to 100 ml samples okay so this is about total solids now i'm going to explain how to evaluate Excuse me, let me check the recording. Sometimes it goes off, it's going good. So, if you want to have a look for a constant time, you please pause the video and have a look. Let me rub it off, okay? To make the things much beauty, you can do like this, okay? Fine, let me rub it off, pause the video, and check if you want to have a look again, okay? Probably it seems like the green color is very very dangerous. It's getting a lot of dark things over here. I should use very less green color. Right. My goodness, this is killing my time. In your comments, some of you also can suggest what chemical to use to clean these things in a very short period of time. It's very painful. Anyway, let it get a little bit of dirty, no problem. Can you please see? Now for the calculation, I'll just give an example. Okay. A sample fifty ML was filtered. Okay. Wet of filter paper is 1.02 gram say for example the weight of the filter paper is 1.02 grams weight of filter paper after oven dried is equal to 1.31 grams so initially the filter paper weighs 1.02 gram then you pour the water you oven dry it then you find it is 1.31 grams now actually for the volatile suspended solids if you ignite the filter paper it will be a problem so let's imagine filter paper is s less s less means s less that means it is itself is a volatile so during the calculation, it won't come. The weight of weight of sample after furnace, so let's say it's going to zero point two five grams. Okay. And one thing is that when you try to get the filter paper inside the muffled furnace, 
This is the buffer. This is the buffer furnace. You are going to get the filter paper. So what we usually do is we used to put all items and the filter paper used to be like this. Alright? And this is called crucible. Crucible means it is a silica. So at very high temperature also this won't break. It is just like a cup, small cup. Okay, very thick one. So inside this we are putting it and some solids may be over here. Okay. After igniting, what I mean to say is after igniting, the sample will be coming like this. This is the crucible and then the sample will be like this. All the black one, this is s -less filter paper. This itself will get evaporated. Okay. So where are the sample after furnace? Along with crucible, say it's called to 50.2 grams. Let this be removed. And when of crucible is called to 50.01 gram. Let's see. So the given question is. Uh, they have done an experiment. The weight well of the filter paper itself is 0 0.12 grams, sorry, 1.02 grams. The filter paper after drying it is 1.31 grams. Filter paper is ashless. Weight well of the sample after the furnace along with the crucible. That means this one is 50.2 gram. Okay. Weight well of the crucible is 50.1 gram that is all of the crucible is 50.01 gram now i'll show you how to estimate okay number one this is the weight of the filter paper therefore total suspended solids will be whatever there is the difference between these two this will be the total suspended solid so this filter paper in addition with some solids it comes 1.31 gram right so total suspended solids is equal to 1.31 minus 1.02 gram but this is in 50 ml so this is around 0 0.29 gram 0 0.29 gram per 50 it is, it is very very highly concentrated so 0 0.29 gram in a 50 ml means you have to convert it so it is 0.29 so this can be something like 0, 0 0.29 divided by 50 into 1000 ml right so I'm putting a thousand ml below is 50 ml so one liter correct this two can be cut it off so this is 50 ml this and this ml will cut so it will come grams per liter so it is comes around 5.8 grams per liter is equal to 5800 milligram per liter but this is really highly concentrated. I'm just giving some arbit values. Is it okay? So this is the concentration of the solids. The total suspended solids is equal to 5800 milligram per liter. Okay. Now the next one is we have to find the total suspended solids total volatile solids so volatile suspended solids 
is equal to that 50.2 minus 50.01 divided by 50 ml into 1000 ml. Correct? So this is 0.19. So this is 3.8 grams per liter. It's called the 3,800 milligrams per liter. This is number two. This is number one. Is it okay? Clear? So now I find the suspended solids and the volatile suspended solids. What about the fixed solids? Just look here. Therefore, fix I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Whatever is left behind, total minus ha huh, total. This is not volatile. This is not volatile suspended. Sorry, sorry. Whatever this is, fix suspended solids. Okay. So volatile, volatile suspended solid is equal to total suspended solids minus total, sorry, minus fixed suspended solids. Whatever the total solids minus fixed suspended solids, this is 5800 minus. 3800 is equal to that is 2000 milligram per liter is volatile. Volatile suspended solids. Finished. Similarly, you can find for dissolved solids. Is that clear? So, this is our total solids. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Okay, so now let me wind up to make the video very short. Let me finish this total suspended solids and I'm going to continue with, ter uh, okay, or I'll do with turbidity also here. Turbidity will be fine. So let me continue with turbidity also, okay. One of the physical parameters this one The next topic is turbidity. I'm not going to explain much about what is turbidity, but I'd rather I'm going to explain what is how to estimate the turbidity. Okay. So for the turbidity, let me give you a little bit small introduction, not much. What is turbidity? Many students confuse. What is turbidity? How it happens? Where it happens? Okay. Turbidity number one is, uh, it is it is not turbidity is not a colloid. It is not a colloid. Turbidity is a phenomenon. Okay, please remember. The moment I said what is turbidity, students said, sir, colloids. No, colloids is not turbidity. The phenomenon is a phenomenon of what? Of light. not able to pass water.
this is called turbidity. This is a phenomenon. Now the next question comes. What caused the turbidity? Next is the cause is due to the presence of colloids. Okay. Now here let me explain you. Colloids are very 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 small particles. Since they are very small particles, they keep on moving in zigzag direction. And they bombard each other, bombard each other due to same charge. So when say for example you may be able to see the whiteboard but if I keep on moving in a zigzag direction like this you may not be able to see the whiteboard plus why I am shaking because I carry the negative charge the another particle colloid is also coming carry negative charge so these two are negative charge when they the moment they come close to each other they repel the moment they repel it comes down but this is also another colloid this is negative because of this two bombardment it comes together here again this is also hit by another one but they came closer here they go because of the repulsion they got again repel but this also repel by another one so they comes closer again they repel so this continuously bombardment makes them move in a zigzag direction and they are not able to settle down because they are very 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 small colloids are very very small okay and this zigzag direction technically we call it the brownian movement okay so this caused the water not to able not able to pass the lights fine so how to measure the turbidity we measure it by using different equipment So right now, some of the equipment is number one. Right now, we are using turbidity meter. Simple, but we should also know in the past what are our technology we have used, even though we don't use anymore. So some of them are Jackson's turbidity meter. Just turbidity meter just try to know the name okay turbidity meter okay and what is the unit the unit is NTU is the unit it is also called nephilometric turbidity unit okay fine so this is about turbidity and how do you remove it how do you remove it by using the process called coagulation and flocculation coagulation flocculation differently I explain in another way okay and what are the coagulant you use coagulant we use is like alum ferric chloride etc okay so this is about the slight things about the turbidity now let me explain how to use a turbidity meter in YouTube's or in some Google class you can find many many turbidity meter it is measured by using the turbidity meter so the procedure let me explain you okay let me explain you the procedure Very simple. Say for example, this is the turbidity meter. You have 
something called this is called qubit this is made of either glass okay this is either made of glass or some teflon i think some teflon i'm not very sure or fiber okay this is transparent so what happened is in this one the light will come and it will go out and all the scattering over here this is measured number one this equipment we have to calibrate okay the standard we use are it also the first based on different equipments like 0 0.1 NTU 1 NTU 10 NTU 100 NTU don't go much more than 100 because it will give a lot of error if you have high concentration what you can do is you can dilute it and you can measure it then you can multiply by the dilution factor or rather inversely we call the multiplication factor okay so you can use a turbidity like this and based on the turbidity i'll explain now the jar test okay this is for the turbidity okay We have the jar test. Let me see whether this recording is still going on. Okay. Now, this another one is called jar test. Jar test means actually you'll have a lot of beakers and then on the top these are all jar. This is a plate. And this is jar number one. This is number two. This is number three. Number four. And then these are pedal steel. Okay. I'll upload in my YouTube channels. The photograph of all these things these are all the pedal steel so number one the objective is what to find optimum dose of coagulant we have to find the optimum dose of coagulant for maximum turbidity removal. Number two is also to find optimum pH. Because what happens is turbidity also depends on the pH of the solution and the alkalinity of the solution. All these things I'll explain in another class, environmental part one, that's still to come in the next semester. But for this, I'm just explaining from practical point of view. Okay. So now, object. The next one is methodology. Method or I'll say procedure. So, number one. All the jars are filled with same same sample okay number two add coagulant add coagulant number one 
varied varied dose varied dose means say you can add over here 1 ml 2 ml 3 ml 4 ml of alum which is already mixed okay number two uh, another experiment it may be vary ph but having same dose of coagulant okay you add the coagulant number three you rapid mix for one minute the objective of rapid mixing is to homogenize the sample with coagulant so it has to be rapid mixing for one minute so that all the coagulant will it will be spread on top of all your samples okay so it will be scattered everywhere is it okay then number two you do a slow mix slow mix for 30 minutes the reason for slow mixing is to form the flocks the agglomeration of the flocks this is for agglomeration of flocks so all the colloids all the colloids will because of the alum will agglomerate and will form a flocks they'll become heavy and they will settle down say for example all this over here here they may they may be settled down like this they may settle down completely in the bottom these flocks are getting are dense okay d e n s e d dense d -N -N -S. you can see you can see clear water okay is it clear so this is the way to do the experiment over after finishing you have to estimate the turbidity of all these samples you have to estimate the turbidity of all the samples okay so let me rub this part I think I, by the end of all this omen class, I will get a lot of good muscles. Now, what you have to do is, this is the results. In the results, you will see you are measuring the turbidity. So, this is say for example, pH 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven and goes on okay and this is another one this is a dose of alum and this is the turbidity this is also turbidity now over here we can see that we have the three experiment or i'll say four five six experiments at a very very low dose the turbidity it decreases this is the initial 
initial turbidity. So, in the first sample, the turbidity decrease up to here. Second, with the increase in the dose, it may comes down. Third, it may comes down. Fourth, it may comes down. Okay. So these are the points. What we expect is the more addition of the alum, it may still to come out. But sometimes we find that it is coming up. I'll explain it. Okay. So these are the values. So when we draw the graph, we find that the graph is like this. Okay. So it is not that with the increase in the dose of the alum, removal is high. It's not that. So this point, this is called optimum dose. Okay. Now, this phenomenon, this is called destabilizing of colloids. Destabilizing of colloids. That means the colloids are destabilized and they are settled down and removed. This part, this is called re-stabilizing of colloids. All these mechanisms can be explained by the concept of double layer theory. But here I want to explain the double layer theory. This is practical. Okay. So optimum dose is this is the optimum dose we want to find out. Is it okay? For a pH, similarly, it also depends on different different pH. An acidic pH removal may be very very less, two may be less, three may be correct, four may be high, five may be high, six may be high, seven may be high. So you may get the graph like this. Or you may get the graph in different different ways based on your sample. Okay. So if you say like this, optimum is this or this can be the optimum pH. Is that clear? So the objective is to find optimum pH. Now, for any experiment, then you can do all the experiment at optimum pH. So that you will get maximum removal by a particular dose of the enum. Is that clear? This is about the turbidity and the colloids. And this is specially meant for the practical classes. So my next class will be on pH, alkalinity, acidity and all the titrations. So for today, thank you.